Well, good morning. morning. Y'all feeling awake? How many of you have never seen me before in your life? You're like, I don't know who this guy is. Okay. Well, my name is Keegan. I'm the lead pastor at our Belton location. It is an honor to be able to fill in for our founding pastor and the pastor of this location, Pastor Stephen. Uh, I just want to say this. He's been away this weekend. Uh, he was doing a wedding, facilitating a wedding uh, for one of our staff. And then he also took the opportunity to take two of his uh, children, his two girls with him and kind of have a daddy-daughter weekend. And so we want him to just be able to enjoy that. So you got me today. Is that all right? All right, we're going to have some fun, though. We're kicking off an exciting series. Before we do that, though, I do want to remind you of two things. Number one, have you heard about There Is More? Raise your hand. Come on. I'm I'm an interactive person, so you you got to let me know you're with me. Um, But There Is More is our three-year campaign for expanding all three of our locations. We have... uh, Harker Heights here, Belton, where I'm at, and then Pastor Nate down in Liberty Hill. And what God has has spoken to Pastor Stephen and and Kyla for the rest of us, too, is that we have more that God wants to bring through Vintage Church. And so to do that, he's told us to make space for it. And so this uh, particular location, we want to break ground by the end of July. And so you'll see our goal is about 242,000 is what we need in cash as a church to be able to, to, to get that and make that happen. And so if you haven't already sown into this or poured into this, I'm going to ask you to pray about it today. Come on, give into things that will last and that have eternal ramifications, right? We want to get this auditorium going. We want to get this space freed up because we're starting that school here in just a few weeks, like Pastor Lindsay mentioned. And I'm telling you, there is no reward like an eternal reward when you sow and invest in the next generation and the kingdom and what God wants to do. And so uh, that's that. We only have uh, 94,000 to go. So that's not a big number, right? We can do that as a church body. Come on. Uh, The next thing I want to tell you is KidsCon is happening next, uh, well, tomorrow and and then through Thursday. And Raising Canes is helping us. They're partnering with us to continue to raise some support to pay for all of that. It takes a lot to to provide something for 200-plus kids. Come on, how many of you have kids? Yeah, it takes a little bit of money to take care of those kids, right? And so we want this event to be amazing. I know so many of you have already sewed into it. You're going to be here. You've got your little ones coming. Julia actually told me, too, that about 20% probably on average of the kids that will come through those doors in the next four nights have never even been to a church, probably have never heard about Jesus or the gospel or the good news. And so if you can be a part of that, seeing God get a hold of a, of a little child's heart and to see them know his love for them at that early age, I'm telling you, it will change the whole course of their life. And so as you go out today, stop by the Raising Cane's over on Knight's Way and tell them you're from Vintage Kids or Vintage Church, and they're going to take 15% of all of the proceeds and, and put it back here to KidsCon. That's a lot. Everybody take a breath. This is great. I feel like I'm working overtime a little bit. We only have two services at my location, so I'm, I'm putting a little, a little extra in today. But I am excited. This is actually my first Sunday being at, at Vintage. I've been here through the weeks and different things, but I've never got to come and just experience a Sunday with the rest of you. And so I'm, I'm really getting excited because it shows me where the Belton location will be in a few more years and where Liberty Hill will be. And just to see hundreds of people coming and gathering to just worship and be spiritual family, it's really been awesome. And so I'm honored to be here. Let's jump into this. Uh, We're starting this series, Ephesus. How many of you got anything out of the last series? Good, good. Well, hopefully you'll get something out of this series too. I know Pastor Stephen will be back next week, and he'll have even more insight. He got to go to Ephesus. A lot of the footage that you saw in the bumper was where he got to travel and kind of walk through some of these places that we hear about in the Bible. And so I'm sure he's going to have a whole lot more for you. But we're kicking this off, and I love the subtitle of this series, Ancient instruction for the modern church, right? This isn't ancient instruction for the modern world, right? We, we got to stop getting upset with the world acting like the world. Guess what the world knows how to do? Act like the world. They don't know what's different. Just like you and I, before we came to know Christ and before we started following God, we only know what we know. Right? And so we don't know how to live different. We don't know how to live better until God shows us. And, I, and, and judgment and instruction always starts with God's people. And the idea is that if we will live the way God has said we should live, then guess what? The world will then become what uh, my favorite, one of my favorite authors, Mark, Batterson, or Mark uh, Buchanan says, that people will become curious and envious. 
They'll see God's people being blessed and see them, you know, overcoming in things in life that they can't overcome and, and walking in a power that they don't know anything about. And guess what? That should make them want to know more and, and go, I don't know. Why is your life different? We are the church. And so God wants to give us instruction, show us how to live victoriously so that we can then model that to the rest of the world. That's how it's supposed to work. And so I love this. Let me give you a little bit of context. The church in Ephesus was founded by the Apostle Paul during his second missionary journey around AD 52. He spent several years in Ephesus preaching the gospel and establishing the church. The book of Acts records that many people in Ephesus were converted to Christianity, just like here in Harker Heights, including both Jews and Gentiles. They were doing the same thing that God calls us to do right here, right now in 2023. Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians, as well as Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, while he was in prison in Rome. Here's the thing about believers. It doesn't matter where you put us, we're still going to proclaim the gospel. Amen. We learned about Joseph in the last seven weeks, about all the trials he went through, and how even in prison, what did he do? He kept proclaiming the gospel. He kept leading people to the Lord. He kept telling them about Jesus. He didn't let his circumstances or his place dictate his profession of his faith. And I would say that's our challenge to see today. This purpose of this letter was to encourage the believers in Ephesus and surrounding areas to live out their faith. This letter emphasizes the unity of believers in Christ and provides practical instructions for Christian living. And I can tell you, it was good for them then, and it's good for us now. See, about 35 years after Paul wrote the book of Ephesians, the apostle John would have an encounter with Jesus that would result in the book of Revelation. And in it, Jesus issues this warning to the church of Ephesus. He says this in Revelation 2, 1 through 5. Write to the angel or elder of the church in Ephesus. Thus says the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil people. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. I know that you have persevered and endured hardships for the sake of my name, and you have not grown weary. These are all great things that Jesus is acknowledging. But I have this against you, he says. You have abandoned the love you had at first. And verse 5 says, remember. Somebody say, remember. remember. How far you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. See, it is possible to do a bunch of great, good things and miss the most important thing which is loving Jesus, loving Christ, your relationship with God. It's not about what you're doing for God. It's about you're getting to know him, about you becoming more and more like him and letting him change and transform your life. And so Jesus is reminding them. I love one of my favorite quotes is from Samuel Johnson. He says this, people need to be reminded more often than they need to be instructed. Most of us don't have an information problem or a lack of information problem. Most of us have a, an obedience to what we know we should do problem. Come on, can you admit it? Come on, we know to be kind, right? We know to be selfless. We know not to do wrong to others. We know not to lie. We know not to cheat, all these things. And yet sometimes we still do them. It's not that we lack the information. It's that we lack the obedience. I'll never forget in one of my devotional times, God spoke to me. He said, why do you live below what you know? Come on, most of us know enough already from God's word to live our lives differently. The question is, will we do it? Will we do it day in, day out, week in, week out? And so God is reminding them, here's the big idea that we're gonna have throughout this next six weeks. We must return to Christ and his plan for the church. See, Ephesus was a lot like what we see today in America and in many places around the world. It was a pagan culture. They worshiped things that were opposed to God. They embraced more and more things that God was uh, against and opposed. And it got them to this place where, listen, it was gonna be real clear whether you were standing for God or not. But here's the thing about when circumstances and culture gets dark, the light just shines even brighter. That's where you and I are called to be, the light in this world. We can't expect people to, to, to just know. We've got to go. The Bible says to preach, to share your faith, to live it out. As we study Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, we'll see that he was establishing what we would now call orthodoxy, which is simply the authorized or generally accepted doctrine. You know, there's a lot of people even standing behind pulpits who have new interpretation of Scripture. 
You know, well, I don't think it really means the same today as it did then. Listen, don't fall for that nonsense. What God said is true in the beginning is still true today. What God said is true about how to live and about marriage and about all these other issues is still true today. We don't have to go in and search for a different new interpretation. No, we just need to find out what God said, what he's still saying today, and do it. Can I get an amen? amen. I'm a little old school, so I need you to talk back to me. I want to make sure you're, you're staying awake, you know. Paul preached one time, and somebody got so bored or got so tired of whatever it was, they fell over and died, and then he had to go down there and work on his resurrection ministry. We don't want to do that today. So just wave at me a little bit, smile. If you give me a look, that's all right. I'll see you after. But no, the idea is that this is not complicated, but it is something that we're called to do. We're called to live our life. And so we're going to see in this first chapter what God calls the mystery of the church. And I'm going to ask you if you would, as it's, uh, we've done even in the last series, would you stand as we honor the reading of God's word? Here in Ephesians 1, 1 through 23, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, not his own, to the faithful saints in Christ Jesus at Ephesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Somebody say every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing. In the heavens in Christ. For he chose us, say he chose us. In him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted, say adopted, adopted. as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ for himself according to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Come on, that's good news. According to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ. As a plan for the right time, say right time, to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on the earth in him. In him we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. Take a breath. So that we who had already put our hope in Christ, say hope might bring praise to his glory. In him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. This is why, verse 15, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I never stop giving thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart, say the eyes of your heart, heart. may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness. Come on, say immeasurable greatness. greatness. Y'all are so good at this. Of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength, He exercised his power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavens. I'm almost done. Far above every ruler and authority, power and dominion and every title given, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected everything, say everything, Everything. under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. You may be seated. We're going to talk about eight things that we get to experience being in Christ. Your two words for today are in Christ. Number one, in Christ we are chosen. Look at this in verse four. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. I love this. You have been chosen. Have any of you been the last person picked at the playground before? Come on, there's a difference between when when you got two captains and you're the first pick. Come on, how do you feel when you're going on that team? I'm feeling real good. That's right, y'all know. And then when this team has five and this team has four and you're the last one left, how do you feel? I mean, you already know what team. Come on, you're not chosen at that point. You're just on the team. God has chosen us. This is powerful. I've told my wife when we got married, I said, Honey, I don't need you. She looked at me like, you better have a real good explanation for for that. I said, listen, I don't don't need you, but I want you. 
I choose you. Come on, if you're chosen, that's way better than just, oh yeah, I, I needed you. I didn't have a choice. Like you were just, come on, there's something about being chosen. I, so many people are running from God and they have no idea. He's chosen them. We've got to tell the world the good news, right? Jesus, before the foundation of the world, decided he was choosing us. He saw the fall. He saw Adam and Eve blow it and all the rest of us ever since. And he said, I've already made a plan because I've chosen them. I've made a plan to make up for that gap, that sin gap, that separation that we all have with God. This is a powerful thing. I'm telling you, these people that struggle with identity crisis, when you know you're chosen by God, it'll solve that. You got to know it. Look at this. Before, uh, we, before God created the natural world, the spiritual one already existed. But he had something even better in mind than all the angels and heavenly beings. He had humanity in mind. Come on, God was thinking about us before he even made this beautiful planet for us to live on. He not only chose us as a species, and make no mistake, we are the pinnacle of his creation. Right? Nothing else that he made did he say he made in his image and in his likeness. And we're going to talk about this in the next point. But not everyone is God's children. You've heard that people tell you that. Well, God, everyone on the planet, we're all God's children. No, we're not. We're all God's creation. But it's not until we're in Christ that we become his sons and daughters. He chose to make us holy and blameless in Christ and in love. Look at this in 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8. We do, however, speak a wisdom among the mature, but not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. On the contrary, we speak God's hidden wisdom in a mystery, a wisdom God predestined before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age knew this wisdom because if they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Do you realize if the enemy had known what God would do through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ to put his presence and, and the Holy Spirit into the lives of countless believers, if he would have known that was the plan on the other side, he would have never crucified Jesus. But God kept that a mystery. And the very thing that he did that he thought was giving him victory actually sealed his fate. Come on, I, I know this is a Bible-believing church. That's a moment to get excited. We are the church of the living God, the one true God. I know you're going to get excited about this. Look at this. When this talks about every spiritual blessing, it's important to understand that these blessings we see unfold throughout this chapter compose a unit or a whole. Together, they express the full scope of God's redemptive activity. Look at this list. Adoption. In Christ, we have been adopted into the family of God. We have his grace. Come on, so many of us so often take his grace for granted. It is by grace that you woke up today, that you still have breath in your lungs. You might want to give him some praise and sing a little bit louder next week. The grace of God. Redemption. Come on, is anybody glad you've been redeemed? Does anybody realize that you were hell bound on a one-way street? Come on, somebody's with me. Forgiveness. Hebrews 9.22 reminds us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. So we were stuck. You and I cannot pay the price for our own sin. We could never cleanse ourselves. We could never atone ourselves. We needed a spotless, blameless lamb. And Jesus was that lamb. And he paid the price for us. So we experienced forgiveness, knowledge. I believe Jesus was telling one of his disciples, I think it was Peter, if I'm not mistaken. He said, who do you say that I am? He said, you're the son of God. You're, you're, you're Christ. He said, yes, and flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. God reveals himself to us. He does it in nature, and most importantly, he does it through his word. If you want to know who the God that runs the universe is, you got to pick up your Bible and start reading it. God reveals his character, who he is, how he wants to function and be in our lives, how he wants us to live and conduct our lives. It's all right here. He gives us that knowledge. An inheritance. All of us have an inheritance. I'm not just talking about your mom and dad's money when they die. Come on, I'm talking about your spiritual inheritance. All of us, and I'm getting ahead of myself, but all of us are heading to eternity. And what are you going to have in eternity? What kind of inheritance are you going to have in eternity when you take your last breath? Because everyone's got an eternity awaiting them. The question is, where are you going to spend it? 
and who are you going to spend it with? I've said this before, I think, when I was here in, a, in another time, but what makes hell so bad is not the weeping and gnashing of teeth or even the, the fire. I think most Texans could even handle most of the heat after being here in July and August. But what makes hell so bad and so horrible is that it's game over. There's no more opportunity to be with God. It's eternal separation. And you might think today that that's not really a big deal. That's not really a concern of yours. I'm telling you, that will be the most horrific thing you can ever experience. God is the greatest thing we can ever experience in life. He is the greatest thing that exists. And a seal of the Spirit. This is a blessing. Our salvation, we're going to talk about this in a moment, but our salvation is secure. The, the scripture we just read says the Holy Spirit was a down payment, and he seals it. Let's move on. In Christ, we are family. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself. See, he made provision for us to be in his family. And, and I'm not going to get too off on a tangent here, but we as sinful humans cannot be in the presence of God in our sinful state. Right? God, it, he's light, and in him there can be no darkness. And so we can't come into his presence and carry in some darkness. And so the only way to be reunited with God and to close that gap is to be in Christ, who has no darkness. Does this make sense? But in the spiritual family, you know what I love about this? God makes up for every gap that we experience. I myself was raised uh, without my father. I had a stepdad for about four years, and then he took off and, and wasn't faithful to my mom and left. And then it was her and I for, I think, another 10, 11 years. So I grew up, really, without a dad in my house. And, and, and I could be another, you know, sadly, statistic, like so many who grow up in a fatherless home. But I can tell you what made the difference. My mom knew about spiritual family. And she kept me in church. And I had, I had godly men and pastors who treated me just like I was their own son. Matter of fact, I had one pastor in, uh, when I was in high school back in Jackson, Michigan, named Daniel Wormuth. And, and I'll never forget, my prom was coming up, and, and it was going to be the next day or whatever. And he had talked to my mom, and, and he said, hey, I want you to meet me on Friday at the church. And I'm like, we've got no services going on on Friday. What are we going to do at the church? I got it. And, and he said, listen, I just want you to meet me there. And, and I didn't have any plans to go to the prom. I didn't have a car. I didn't have, you know, a date. I was just, you know, going to skip it, I guess. And... I had a friend of mine who had asked me. She didn't have a date either, and we were just friends. She's like, hey, you want to go? And, and I said, well, yeah, we can go, but I'm not sure how we're going to get there. So I go. My mom takes me over there and drops me off. And he had his Lincoln Town car detailed, washed, gassed up, and he handed me the keys. And he said, hey, you're, you're my son, and you need to go to the prom in style. And you need to go pick that lady up, and you need to do right. Don't, don't be new down squirrely with that lady. But I want, you, I want you to take her, and I want you to have a good time. I didn't have a gap because being in spiritual family, God made up for that. And over and over again, he would put godly men in my life to make that gap. And I'm telling you, there's some of you, your home life, yeah, you can, you can praise him for that. Some of you, maybe you, your, your mom wasn't around. Maybe your dad wasn't around. Or maybe you're, you're an only child like me, and you're like, man, I, I need somebody to play with. I don't got no siblings. Listen. You got more than enough if you'll look around and see what God has blessed you with and provided within spiritual family. It's powerful. Spirit is thicker than blood. In Christ, neither Jew nor Greek. There's no caste system. My dad's from India. But I'm telling you, in, in Christ, there's no caste system. There's no social, you know, hierarchy. No, in Christ, we're all one. Amen? Let me keep going. The lie of prioritizing diversity, you know the root word of diversity is division. And so often our world wants to celebrate all the ways that we're different. But can I tell you, just like Pastor Stephen, you've heard him say it over and over, what we need to celebrate is what unifies us. Yes, we're diverse. And that's a beautiful thing. God's made us all different. We come from different walks of life, different upbringings. But what the thing that we need to celebrate is, is how God pulls us all together in his family. And in Christ, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter your nationality. It doesn't matter your background. We're all in the same place in him. There's not a greater unifier than being in Christ. Not even you sports fans who want to rally around your team. There's not a greater unifier. Number three, in Christ we are forgiven. 
Man, every one of these eight points I could stay on for about 50 minutes. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Is anybody glad that you've been forgiven? Amen. Come on, how often do you think about that? How often do you really reflect on the fact that, you know what, if Jesus never did another thing for me, the fact that he's forgiven me and saved me and redeemed me so that I can spend eternity with him and I can know him now is worth everything. It's worth everything. Come on, let's never take that for granted. So many of us just want to move on so fast from our sin and minimize it. No, our sin is a big deal. It literally separated us from God and was sending us to hell. And there was nothing we could do about it, but he stepped in and bridged that gap. It's powerful. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone, say anyone, is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. I said this in the first two services. Some of you have accepted Jesus Christ, but you still haven't accepted this truth that you are a new creation. Some of you are still walking around with guilt and shame and frustration about things that you've done in your past. Can I tell you to let it go? Believe God's worth or his word about your worth. In one moment, when you give your life to Christ, you're born again. You're now a new creation. And does that mean that you just, you know, forget about the things you've done or that it's like they never happened? Listen, there is still a sanctification process. You will still learn to, to walk in the ways that God calls you to live. But in your standing with God, you are brand new. Don't let the enemy beat you up about, hey, but I remember what you did six years ago. Come on, no one can live like that with that cloud hanging over their head, that weight. Jesus doesn't even call you to wait, to live with that over your head, with that weight. Some of you need to forgive yourself. If Christ isn't holding on to your past, why are you? Why are you? Don't. Walk out of here free today. Free in Christ, knowing you're a new creation. Number four, in Christ we have hope. Verse 12 says, so that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. We have eternal hope that everything will be worked out in the end. We do. Everything may not get worked out this side of heaven. But there is an eternal hope that we hold on to. There will be one day. Look at this in Micah 4.3. He will settle disputes among many peoples and provide arbitration for strong nations that are far away. They will beat their swords into plows and their spears into pruning knives. Nation will not take up the sword against nation and they will never again train for war. There is a time that Jesus will return and set everything straight. The Bible says every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And when that comes, guess what? There won't be any more fighting. It'll be over. And he'll rule and reign. And those of us that are in Christ will rule and reign with him. Come on, if you don't believe me, read your Bible. Number five, in Christ we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. In him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. Another translation and definition of that word sealed is stamped. Come on, God has marked you. If you are in Christ, God has stamped you. you. You belong to him now. You know what that means? That means nobody can take your salvation from you. God gave it to you and nobody else can take it from you. That should be good news. Now, I'm not saying that, that now that you're saved and the Holy Spirit has sealed you, that you can go live however you want and not have consequences and not have to worry about anything. Listen, I don't know if you're really saved. All right, I can look for fruit, but ultimately only God knows your heart. But I'm telling you, if you're living for God and you're totally surrendered to him and you're doing your very best to follow him, you don't have to worry about your salvation when you go to take your last breath. It is a sure thing because when God says something, he means it. And when he promises something, guess what? He follows through. Come on, some of us have broken promises and we've had promises broken to us, but aren't you glad God's not like you and me? He's way beyond us, and he keeps and fulfills his word. Number six, in Christ, we can access wisdom and revelation. How many of you would like some wisdom and revelation to get through life? Would you give, would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him? See, revelation is greater than information. And I'm going to go a little bit long, but I'm going to try and keep it a little bit short. But here's the thing. 
It doesn't do us any good to just have information about God. We've got to have revelation of how to even follow God and live the way he's called us to live. It doesn't matter if we know all about God, but we don't live according to the way he says to live. And as you read your Bible, as you spend time with God, I would encourage you, when you open it up, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you his word so that it goes from here and travels down to your heart and into your spirit. And then you really, truly know what it means and what he's saying. It's only then that it really becomes real. That's the moment in our life when it, when it starts to matter and we'll start to shift our other things in life to be subject to what God says. It's not enough just to have information. We need revelation. Number seven, these are my last two. In Christ, we can access God's power. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? I was listening to a preacher, uh, an 81-year-old lady this week, tearing it up. She was preaching, and I love something she said. She said, I don't know why so many people get nervous and and act like the devil's got all this power. She goes, he doesn't even have keys to his own house. Because Jesus already went and snatched those, right? And some of us are living our lives void of the power that's available to us. We sing about it. Oh, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is alive in me, but I don't even have the boldness to talk to my neighbor. Really? I do this to my, in my location a lot. Really? Come on. You either have the spirit of God living on the inside of you or you don't. But if you do, guess what? The righteous are as bold as a lion. And the wicked run when no one's even chasing them. Come on. Are you bold in this place? Are you righteous in him? It's real quiet in here. I'm almost done. I promise. Pastor Lindsay's coming up here to help me land the plane. 1 John 4, 4. You are from God, little children, and you have conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Which is my last point. In Christ, we have overcome the world. Somebody say overcome. Overcome. And he subjected everything under his feet. Here's the brass tacks of it. We, in and of ourselves, are powerless. I don't care what you bench or weight, lift or whatever. In the bigger things in life, we are powerless to overcome them apart from Christ. But with his strength, guess what? You can put your shoulders back. You can put your head up high. And you can go through any situation. You can deal with any adversity. Anything that comes your way, you have victory and you can overcome. Why? Not because you got the victory, but because you're appropriating the victory that Christ has already won. Do you know the battle is already over? The victory is already won. It's just about will we take it and run with it. That's what we're called to do as believers. Run with God's victory. Be an overcomer. There's nothing sadder than a defeated Christian. It's sad for people who have the Spirit of God living in them to to, to live and function like they just don't have any. I, I don't know if God will do it. I don't know. Come on, where's your faith? Your God is the God of the impossible. So why did you stop praying for that situation? Pray again. Well, they're sick and I haven't seen it. I don't care. Knock and keep knocking. Ask and keep asking. Where is your faith, church? He overcame, which means we can overcome. I'm done. You still got time to go to Raising Cane's, I promise. I'm telling you. And I know Pastor Stephen and Pastor Nate, they will stand up here and say the same thing. Just like Paul, I want to persuade you to believe God and to live your lives empowered like he has called you to do it. I love that we have a pastor that is not afraid to be bold. I'm telling you, you need to be praying for him. You need to be praying for Pastor, Ky- Pastor Kyla and, and their family. You need to be praying for our church. Why? Because we're taking ground. And you know what the enemy hates? When we start taking ground. We've got the school launching, the leadership college, all these great things because we want to help people live their lives to the fullest in the power of God. We gotta pray push all that darkness out of here I'm really done with every head bowed every eye closed every service we want to give you the opportunity 
to give your life to Christ. It is the greatest decision any of us can ever make. Knowing God is the greatest thing we can ever experience. And today, if you're not in Christ, I'm just going to tell you, frankly, good luck. You're going to do the best you can, but I'm telling you, you're going to fall short. And life's going to get the better of you. But if you surrender your life, if you give your life to Christ, you can walk in victory. And that doesn't mean that you won't have difficulties, but even in those difficulties, you can still be victorious. I'm asking you to get serious about your faith. You're not promised tomorrow. And I'm not trying to scare you into, into heaven, but I am trying to keep you out of hell. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. Now is the acceptable time. Don't fool around with your eternity. Surrender your life to him today. I promise you, you'll never regret it. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to give you an opportunity. If you've never accepted Christ, you've never surrendered your life to him, today is your day. I'm going to ask you in just a moment to raise your hand. And maybe you've said this prayer, you've given your life to Christ, but truly you've kind of put God on the back burner and you started living for yourself and doing everything in your own strength. But you've recognized today, right here in this moment, that you need to recommit your life to Christ. You can do that right here. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. If you're giving your life to Christ for the first time or recommitting, in the count of three, just lift your hand. One, two, three. Come on, lift them high. Jesus said, if you acknowledge him before men, he'll acknowledge you before his Father. I see you. I see all those hands. Come on, angels are rejoicing. Every time someone gives their life to Christ, heaven, the heavens throw a party. Church, I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. And if you raise your hand, I want you to say these words from your heart straight to God. And then we're going to help you with the next steps. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for my sin, to pay the price that I should have paid so that I could know you so that I could be redeemed, so that I could be forgiven. I acknowledge that I needed you. I needed a savior. And I receive your gift of salvation. I ask you to come into my heart, not only to be my savior, but to be my Lord from this day forever. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.